Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our latest webinar, and thanks for joining us. Today, we're joined by uh, Chief Inspector Sarah Gilmore of South Yorkshire Police and Jonathan Durow, formerly of South Yorkshire Police, but now of West Yorkshire Police. And we're presenting an overview of the solution they've adopted and developed in terms of using M365, Microsoft 365, to help improve the way that they have scrutiny panels, virtual scrutiny panels around stop search. Um, all forces obviously have a requirement around this, and we'll be showing you how this force has done this. And of course, then you can learn and adapt that and think of potentially dozens of different ways that you could actually apply this same sort of approach in different areas. Now, of course, one of the biggest challenges facing policing at the moment is around maintaining and building the public trust. And we all know how controversial the use of stop search powers have been and how perhaps misunderstood they are. So public scrutiny is a really vital part of this as we move forward. So being able to do that scrutiny and open it up to more people who perhaps wouldn't come to a police station is part of the approach we've done in this. At this point, before I ask uh, Sarah to provide a, an overview, um, this is really a use case. You don't need any apps to download for this one. It's part of the 365 build that you're able to implement and move it across. And what we'd ask is to get your questions in as normal and we'll get Sarah and John to provide answers as we go through. So if you've got a question, a concern, how did you tackle this challenge? Please pop it into the chat and we'll bring them through the session as we get going. So. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll get started. So Sarah, first of all, welcome to our session and thanks for joining us. Could you explain your role and where you've why you've adopted this approach around scrutiny panels? I can, yeah. After afternoon everyone and thanks for having us uh, along. So my name's Sarah Gilmore and I'm uh, one of the force uh, leads around stop and search. Um, so I probably took over this role in force in, in June last year. Uh, where we were obviously uh, halfway through the COVID pandemic um, and it was kind of really clear from picking up uh, this role that there was a real lack um, around scrutiny uh, for our force um, and we have various different districts within our um, force and each one was doing something slightly different and um, it was really kind of inconsistent um, and the public panels had, had pretty much fallen by the wayside and they just weren't happening so we had really very little uh, scrutiny, both internally and, uh, and externally um, around our, our panels, really. And probably one of the other things um, that we had as well was a, around the scrutiny panels, what that uh, panel consisted of, um, a real lack around the diversity of those panels. So for me, taking over that role, uh, like David's just uh, really kind of commented on, in order for us to have trust and confidence in what we do around um, stop and search, it was really important to get these panels up and running. Um, so ultimately what we have tried to create in South Yorkshire is one central um, scrutiny panel covering uh, the whole force because this allowed us to make sure that we've got a consistent approach um, around it. And we also wanted to look at utilising the 3.6 platform around doing that virtually. So should we ever have anything like the pandemic or any kind of issues before, uh, again, we wanted to obviously have that 3.6.5 uh, platform where we could do it virtually rather than uh, having people come into various police stations. Um, I guess one of the biggest challenges for, for us moving forward around this, um, what, what used to happen certainly in South Yorkshire is we have an app called Pronto, which um, is our stop and search document. Um, the scrutiny panels uh, had access to this and that's ultimately what they were scrutinising, which is which I found very difficult um, as a member of public. You don't sort of kind of really get a true uh, understanding of what the officers are doing, how they engage with that uh, person, what, what they do and what the build up and the circumstances uh, were around it. So for us uh, to improve that trust and confidence in the community, we really wanted to put our focus around showing that body worn footage. Um, and I would say sort of like one of the biggest challenges for us was around the disclosure. How can we share um, those uh, samples um, with the public? 
um, of getting around the disclosure uh, issues as, an, uh, as a force because ultimately at the videos they would see uh, people, date of birth, names, ordinarily something that the, the public uh, wouldn't have. So that were kind of the real big, big sort of like challenges we initially faced when we started looking at how, how we could do this. Um, really helpful having a look around what some of the other forces did around so that gave us a really good idea of, of where we kind of really wanted to go um, and then once I decided it was a for force panel that's when uh, Jonathan and Rich came on board and we started looking at the 365 platform and, and what that would uh, give us um, as, as that structured force panel to allow people to watch that virtually from home um, and I guess one of the big things around um, utilising it that way is we had people who potentially have mobility issues who couldn't get out of the home but were really keen um, to be involved in, in these panels. Um, so that's sort of like the biggest challenge. Uh, and then I guess the other one to kind of touch on, I know I'll flick through some of the slides, um, was uh, the recruitment. How, how do we get members of the public involved in this? Um, how do we get it out there uh, and what do we kind of want to achieve uh, around that? So I think the early kind of conversations around the disclosures uh, for me certainly was going to our for force um, compliance unit and having those really early kind of conversations to say this is what we want to achieve out of this. Um, do you see any barriers? Uh, this is what we've kind of got in place. So ultimately, at every stage along the way with me and Jonathan, they were up to speed with what we what we wanted to achieve out of it so they could kind of support. So they wasn't getting a disclosure documentation from myself um, with no sort of like understanding of, of, of what we're trying to achieve uh, here. And the scrutiny is really important around stop search it is a national um, issue. And, and, and in order to make things better with the community, we wanted to look at how we could get that out in in the community how do we feed things back and and really get the contributions uh, of members of the public but have it as a true reflection of the community um and that, and that's what was really important around the recruitment around the panels so the how we got uh, and how we recruit with the panels was uh, we did a big uh, drive around social media um, asking people to kind of contact myself directly if they were um, if they were interested in, in joining them panel and just giving them a little uh, bit of a flavour of uh, what that um, time and that panel uh, kind of uh, consisted of really. So we did the drive via social media and then um, as a neighbourhood chief inspector it, it was great for me because I've got the local neighbourhoods to kind of share that on their um, social media pages and then we'd got the um, the NAGS and neighbourhood uh, action group so lots of, of ways out to kind of pr promote that and we got quite a lot of interest within the first kind of couple of weeks and then from that we kind of moved on to uh, doing um, day sessions, evening and morning, just little inputs about what that role would be, what stop and search is about, and just so that it got kind of got an in, introduction um, from me really around uh, who I was and what what the aim of uh, the panels were. Um, so Sarah, just picking up on a couple of points already, what's the big difference between the way that you're doing panels now and the way that you were doing them beforehand? Are you sharing any different information at all? Yeah, we're definitely sharing different information. So before they got a, a record of the stop and search, which was sanitised as where well, what we're doing now with the panels is I'm sharing the live data from our stop and search database. Um, so anything that I've got access to, I share so we can look at sort of like the trends, any sort of issues that we're picking up that I've picked up or the internal panel have picked up that I want to take to the public panel uh, for sure. And then the biggest one is the body worn footage. It was something that was never seen uh, before on, on the panels and something that I felt was really important for the public to see from start to finish so that they could understand sort of why we're doing that stop search and the kind of build up of, of the circumstances around it. So it's much more transparent than perhaps you were before in terms of the, the amount of scrutiny that's actually been enabled using this approach. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's also down to the selection of, of the footage. 
Um, so we have an independent person from uh, the police crime commissioner who works with that public panel and they select a random uh, sample. So all I do prior to that uh, meeting um, is make sure that the body worn footage is available uh, and then on the day they will select the random selection and I will just upload that and live stream. So ultimately it'll be the first time that I've also seen it and that's so that we can have that transparent uh, ap approach. Could you take us through the, the actual process then, so and how 365 supports this? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hoping Jonathan will kind of help uh, in this. So ultimately what we had to create around uh, this disclosure process um, was a confidentiality um, agreement, uh, something that we can send pre uh, the session. Uh, so this is uh, just kind of a bit of a briefing to say that you're going to kind of see things uh, that ordinarily you wouldn't as a member of the public and that anything you do see and hear will be confidential. And that's really important uh, to get through some of the disclosure things uh, later on through the DPIA. So we ensured that those were in uh, a, a process and, and completed first. So they ultimately send and sign them back. And Jonathan created that link through uh, Adobe Reader. Um, so I obviously get a confirmation once they've completed and signed that. And then how the process works is via, via Teams, and I'm sure Jonathan will jump in, I'm sure here, is we uh, have created both an internal and external uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, because like when I talk about the public external panels, we have also changed the internal panels um, and they're very much running completely uh, online at the moment. Uh, so the teams, uh, we have the dedicated team, so they're added to the team. So we, here we, sh we share uh, any information, any documentation. And then around um, the scrutiny panels themselves, what we created is we wanted to have a live document um, which we've utilised through Microsoft Forms. So these are the, all the key areas uh, that as an organisation, uh, as, as you uh, as force lead, I would want to see uh, and also some recommendations around HMIC. So after we have uh, set up the videos and they're uh, streamed uh, via Microsoft Teams, then every individual before we even enter into a conversation completes uh, the Microsoft form. So this is sent uh, via a link uh, to them and they can use that on the mobile uh, laptop or, or by the phone. And it's just a series of questions. I think we created a, roughly around 20 um, questions for them to kind of answer on what they've seen. And I think the really important bit around that was we wanted that to be what their thoughts were individually. Uh, so they complete that. And then that that obviously pings through in, into the responses. So it gives gives you ultimately instant results about um, whether they thought the search was done appropriately, whether officers use go go wisely, whether they thought uh, communication skills um, went effectively. So we kind of have that instant uh, res response uh, from how and what they viewed on that stop search. So uh, off I bring in John. Uh, what aspects were you looking at from a technical point of view around this and supporting Sarah? In my kind of supported role as a tech specialist with South Yorkshire Police, I initially supported in terms of creating the forms um, and we probably had about, I guess, probably about five draft draft forms we did because uh, it was kind of a bit of to and throw in between, you know, making sure it, it was easy to fill out. So we, you know, we improved it many times over uh, to make sure it was just user friendly. Uh, so I was just editing it and polishing it off at times. Um, and in the end, we found it, you know, obviously a good product. Um, I supported with Microsoft Teams, um, so I kind of attended um, the uh, the panel, uh, you know, face to face, and I just made sure that the features of Microsoft Teams were used, you know, to the, I guess, their potential. Um, things like altering the, um, you know, when you go on to a, a Microsoft Teams call. We wanted to make sure that the the audio was working correctly. Uh, so we'd go on to the um, when you go on to your mute feature, there is a little toggle which says include computer sound. So it's little things like that that I just kind of had to just you know make sure that again Teams has been used correctly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a relatively easy uh, a process to follow in terms of. 365 it's, it's been quite easy to or self-explanatory to make um, and work. 
So, yeah. Sarah, just thinking about what sort of the benefits you've achieved out of this, what sort of things have you found? And I'll pop your screen back on as well so you can talk us through some of those points that what you've found by doing this. Yeah, certainly. I think sort of like one of the biggest things that uh, we've definitely uh, found is uh, is sort of like the, the quality and the feedback that we've had from members of the public, uh, exceptionally seeing the body worn footage. So we've had various people that the first couple of panels uh, we ran um, like like Jonathan says, a test ones really to sort of like get all the Microsoft forms and documents uh, correctly. But just just that people um, that ordinarily may not have got into the station or want to obviously do be involved, but be, be at home, have that option uh, to do that, certainly from the 365 element, because we can just live stream it um, uh, straight away. And, and, it, and it's been really good across the Microsoft forms, all the data is there for me to capture, to look at and to review and to kind of share that back in um, the following week. It's obviously streamlined at the minute. We had used to have four individual um, meetings across the four uh, four districts. Now that's kind of streamlined into one central force panel. Um, and because of sort of like the uptake it's taken, the public are, are really have loved seeing the body worn footage. And I think it's kind of been a bit of an eye opener. Uh, so it's kind of built on our relationships with the public around what we're doing around stop and search uh, and, and certainly uh, we've taken from uh, what we've done on Teams, uh, it was sharing that information on our local media pages. The public are now seeing what we're doing around uh, stop and search. And I think the general overall feeling is that it's just added so much more value to the people who potentially might not have been able to get into the station, but allowing uh, that footage to be streamed. The panels uh, have really sort of like been really high on the uptake. Initially, we had around about 60 people who wanted to be involved, but we've kind of got a strong panel base of about 25 people now. Um, and I'm sure as as we progress, people will come in uh, and, you know, and, and people will kind of leave. But it's really important, I think, to continue uh, looking at that. But it's been instrumental for Jonathan and, and the people who've been involved in the pilot to make sure we've got the right things in place, got the right documentation. And I guess it'll just be developing it as we're moving along, but improving that trust um, and confidence. Certainly as a force, we've had already things, we've, we've held a couple now, external ones, and that um, the, how the panel's been set up has been already fed back into our, our chief officers about what the impact's been and how good they think it's uh, kind of operating. Um, and, and you know, and it's already led on to doing other things on teams as part and stop and search in relation in relation to we do the scrutiny panels now, but we also hold um, what's called a focus group where we'll start where we start to talk about disproportionality, for example, or trends around uh, our, our data or, or, or issues that we've kind of come across that we want to kind of address really. Um, and I think, you know, the diversity of the panels is getting better. I think we've still got work to do around that, but I'm hoping that as the panels progress and people see how others are involved in it, other people will, will find it interesting and, and kind of want to come on board, really. And, and just picking up on that point, some members of the community have an issue with actually attending a police station. So do you think that uh, you'll reach people who traditionally would like to be involved but wouldn't want to come to the police station as a result of this approach? Yeah, absolutely. We've already had that already. When I first put the recruitment out, there were a lot of people who kind of contacted me uh, to say that they, you know, couldn't physically get into a police station but wanted to be involved. So we've we've definitely got a real mix of members. Um, and what and, you know, and that's just from the public aspect. The internal uh, side of things as well. We've set up the exact same. Um, system, uh, got a team set up on the internal and, and that is all absolutely online. Uh, it's all, all done via teams with the body worn footage uh, across all our policing family. So it, it's really sort of like been really good and fingers crossed it's going really well for us at the minute. OK, brilliant. So let's go to some of the questions that are coming in and please do keep your questions coming in. Some of them you may have covered in your presentation already, but uh, let's pick up some of the questions. So we've got uh, Sam, as uh, as says, he appreciates that we're trying to appeal to a broader base as possible. But when attracted members, do you use any sort of pre vetting to carry out before you allow them to join a panel? Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I meant to cover that. Uh, vetting, um, initially we looked at full vetting, uh, which I, I, you'll all know would take many weeks um, and we balance that off with the risk. So all we've done and certainly what got signed off by our, our de uh, 
Deputy Chief Constable, uh, was that we would do the basic checks. So uh, we have I've got um, application forms. I'm happy to share any of the documents, but we created an, an application form and then from that we just uh, vetted them via PNC, via Connect, just to make sure that we'd got the basics and that was uh, part and parcel of uh, the risk assessment in our DPIA, our disclosure documentation. So anyone doesn't go through the full vetting, it is literally just the basics checks that we are happy with and we've got a real vast um, sort of broad um, scope of people there. We've got retired uh, head teachers, we've got just members of the community who run groups. It's a real sort of like mixed uh, open group, which is uh, really good because obviously that opens it up when you start talking about uh, various things to do with stop and search. OK, so the next question is around, uh, do you have any confidentiality agreements in place with members and do you redact or pixelate any of the footage? We've already mentioned that you do have a confidentiality agreement that they sign at the beginning of each session, but what about redaction? No, I, we, we've got the confidentiality agreement and then I've got a confidentiality brief, so I just brief it out as the chair just to say that what we see stays within the group um, to make sure that they understand what there is. And, and it covers kind of key bits around whether if they potentially know somebody uh, and, it, and it has happened at one of the panels um, and we just ask them to leave for that uh, meeting and then we bring them back in um, afterwards. So it's, it's really about building that trust within the panel, but they do get that brief from me sign the documentation, but we don't pixel any of the uh, footage because I, I, I felt and I built that into the disclosure documentation because I felt that that would potentially have an impact on what the public thought. I wanted them to see uh, the whole the whole thing without uh, pixeled out or any sort of like look at it beforehand. They're seeing it the first time as I would. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, it, out, out of the ones that we've done so far, there's been, you know, somewhere you think, Right, OK, there's a lot to lot to learn there, but that's part and parcel of us being open and honest with our community. We are going to get things where we do things wrong sometimes. Uh, it's about how we feed that back and what we do with that feedback. Thanks. And I'm going to put this quick next question to Jonathan. It's a more technical one. So um, do you create users accounts for them, uh, for the guests, for the panel members, or how do you invite them in and how do you manage that whole side of providing them access to the team's environment where they're working? Yes, not a problem, David. Um, so with Teams and Forms, they can access them through a guest account. Um, the link we sent out with Microsoft Forms um, is designed in a way where anybody that link is sent to, can they can answer that those questions there. Um, that, is a, that is a functionality or it's part of Microsoft Forms. Um, in terms of Teams, um, we are able to invite people into teams externally through you know their uh, their email address um again anybody that's provided that with that link they can access it um so th there's no accounts needed as such yeah. yeah and that picks up on another question here about an external team site where you upload documents and that's not exactly what you're doing you're sharing the documents via the team meeting only aren't you exactly yeah and the uh, the link for the microsoft form is put in the conversation as well of yeah. the existing call yeah so, so after the meeting, the users don't get access to anything that they've seen during that meeting? No. That's right. And Sarah, how do you manage the issue around people recording the body worn footage on their own mobile devices, which we could have had in any in in-person events anyway, but uh, do you, have you taken that into account or is that part of the confidentiality agreement? Yeah, that's part and parcel of the confidentiality agreement. So that's one of the lines on there about being on, you know, when they're signing that documentation, they're saying that they're on their own, they're not going to record it. Uh, and, you know, and again, yes, it is uh, an organisational risk, but so is uh, scrutiny if we don't get it right uh, around stop and search. Um, so it's about balancing that that risk off and and thankfully the disclosure documentation was signed off and and, and we've not had any issues so far um, around that uh, and you know hopefully with by signing that agreement um, we can obviously take any action needed if 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 that was to happen. And there's a question here from Tina about the hybrid option. Uh, are you considering using these as both as a hybrid approach so that members of the community who can't join virtually can still take part in the same panel? Yeah, absolutely. So we we offer we we normally have a venue, so we'll uh, we'll hold a venue because some people do obviously want to come in, uh, but a lot want to be online. So we do both. Um, so I, I will be at the live venue um, wherever that is, 
uh, and we'll try and do that across the force to allow people at various districts to to participate if they want to come in person. And a nice practical question here from Julie. How long do you think panels tend to last uh, and how do you, how many would you how many select clips would you potentially get through in a, a single panel? It, that, that is a really good question uh, and we've done lots of tests around it and I, I would say roughly each panel is lasting a couple of hours um, and that's why recently we've kind of moved to uh, the scrutiny panel with the added on um, additional focus group uh, because quite often we were initially started to talk about stop and search and you can imagine that can lead to a number of questions so on the normal panels we were getting through about five samples um, but as we move forward we're hoping that we might be able to to push that to around about 10 uh, and we meet in sort of every six to eight weeks uh, for the external and it's every six weeks for the internal um, panels because I appreciate it. So ideally I want to do a few more, but um, we have done dropping ones or certainly we've got some planned in. So if, for example, we have an issue uh, uh, over a certain area around stop and search, we'll put an additional one. If let's say we wanted to look at all the youths that we searched in February, we can obviously do that selection and, and narrow that down uh, via our body worn uh, footage. Uh, one of the big issues at the minute is around body officers wearing body worn footage. So lots of training um, and lots of drive around that as well at the moment. That's great. And I'll just go for one final question because we've got that many questions coming in and I'm sure you'll be happy to share some documentation. And Richard in our team from the business engagement team will be there to help as well with that. But there was a question in from Essex who are running a similar thing for their procedural justice. Have you had to do anything technical to improve the user experience around streaming capability? Jonathan, probably best to come on this one. Nothing technical at all, uh, uh, David. Um, you know, it was very self-explanatory in Microsoft Teams. Um, it, it all, it all, it all in Teams basically encompasses the, our needs with this. Um, so we didn't need to do any further, um, I guess, improvement with any streaming at all. No, and in fact, this whole event today is run on Microsoft Teams. It's just the live part and it streams ridiculously well. Uh, yeah. Generally, we don't normally have problems with, with that sort of thing. So look, there's so many more questions in here. Uh, one of the, well, final question for you, Sarah, around DPIA. Was there a DPIA in, in place before the physical meetings uh, or is it, if you had to develop it and do a different one for the virtual approach? Yeah, there wasn't anything in place um, around the paper version, so it's all uh, really brand new. So I had to complete and, and pull together a, a total new uh, DPIA. But I guess the good thing is, is once it's in, uh, certainly now I've started the stop and search. The use of force at lead is now on board, so they have you now use my stop and search uh, DPIA to ensure that they now run uh, use force panel meetings with members of the public and they've started to show body worn footage and they're just going to go live with their public meeting. So uh, in the force already, we're seeing it being used by others. Now we the work's been done and the sign off is there. We will be running a, a workshop on this a 90 minute session uh, later on in the month. So and we've got a number of events coming up at the moment. So the links in the chat or it will be on the video as well. If you want to come along to the workshop where Sarah and Jonathan and others will come along and share more detail. That's probably where we can share some of the documentation as well around this. So please do join that workshop on the 21st of March. You've got on screen there the other events that we've got coming up. So next week we have a collaboration workshop which picks up on the Federation and guest access sessions we've previously done and gets into some real detail around that. So please do join us next Tuesday. Then Wednesday, Operation Hampshire, we are making the uh, national app available. Uh, through the Enabling Centre and Solutions catalogue and you'll hear from Andy Rhodes around how to, to use that and how to implement that across your force. So please do join us for that. Also, we've got the targeted hotspot patrol app uh, coming up with Thames Valley the following week. So there's quite a lot coming through uh, at the moment. As many of you do know, the NEP is actually closing down as a programme uh, at the end of this month. So you will start to see things like the Enabling Centre rebrand into a bit more purple as it comes under the umbrella of the PDS and you'll start seeing a few more of those things as we go along through this month and we transition many of the, the core things that have been doing through NEP into the business as usual capability of the PDS and most of you will have noticed the PDS, the webinars themselves now have already been changing brands so we've got a lot going on 
it's really important you do keep in touch with us. Really big thank you to Sarah and John for joining us today. We really do appreciate the 40 sharing their experience on this. So please, if you've got an experience, and we'd love to hear from Essex a bit more about what they're doing around their panels and adopting 365 in their approach. If you've got something to share that can help another force, please get in touch so we can pick up on those, those things. But once again, thanks everybody for joining us. It's half past the hour. That's where we want to leave it. So see you next week and hopefully at some of our consultation and workshops coming up very soon. Thanks everyone.